Welcome back to ACCA paper F9 on financial management. Last time we were discussing the uh, present value calculations for cash flows and what the discounting process was all about. Uh, the technique of discounting allowed us to take a future receipt of cash and be able to convert it into an equivalent present value uh, equivalent. And this allows us, therefore, to uh, differentiate between the timing of cash flows and to restate them all in present value terms. Now, the idea of a net present value, the way in which this helps us to understand and appraise projects, is to make a distinction between the initial investment value, which is the, uh, in this case, 200 and the returns that are generated, the cash inflows from the project, in this case from years one to five inclusive, we have a row of cash inflows and these are being discounted to a present value as one can see on this line here um, at 10%. So the line here, 90, starting with 90.9, shows the present value of the numbers in the line above, discounted at 10%. If we add these five years of cash flows together, one can confirm that they add up to a total present value of 426. This is the present value of the cash flows generated by the project from years one to five. Now, against this, we need to deduct the initial investment value of 200, which corresponds to year zero. This is the investment amount. If we deduct the investment amount from the present value of the future cash flows, we are left with a net amount of 226. This is the net present value, a value surplus or excess amount over the initial investment. So in this sense, the net present value of our cash flows above is 226. Now we just have one quick um, Re let us revisit the uh, payback method uh, briefly, and in this case, um, apply a discounting uh, treatment to the cash flows. As one can see here, whereas the simple payback method would have meant balancing the cash flows in their future values against the initial investment, in this case, the simple payback would have been exactly two years to recover the $200. One can see this by adding the two 100s together. In the case of the discounted payback, we are discounting the future cash flows, and therefore we can see that in order to cover the $200 initial investment, we need to go travel further along the timeline and take into consideration some portion of the year three cash flows since we are now adding and accumulating present values. Now for the purpose of investment appraisal, there are a number of things we have to take into account. In order to determine whether a project is worth doing or not, we need to identify relevant cash flows. Relevant cash flows means we have to find or identify those cash flows that make a difference to the outcome of our project. For example, cash flows which occur whether or not the project goes ahead would not be relevant because they do not influence the outcome of the project. Such examples would be sunk costs or committed costs and also costs which are transferred in or allocated from somewhere else in the company. In other words, they exist anyway, but they're simply being charged to our project. And of course, non-cash expenses for a different reason. They are not cash.
cash flows. Now, once we have our cash flow set up, an interesting uh, way to analyze the numbers is to determine what the internal rate of return of those cash flows will be. The internal rate of return has a special definition. It is the discount rate at which the future, the present value of the future cash flows will be equal to the initial investment amount, i.e., the net present value will be equal to zero. Now, one of the curiosities and uh, possibly obscure features of the IRR calculation is that any cash flows generated in the course of the project are treated as though they are being reinvested at the IRR rate until the project conclusion. We can illustrate this phenomenon in the following way. Take these simple cash flows which involve an investment amount of 20,000 in year zero, 5,000 in year one, and 30,000 in year two. These cash flows have an IRR, which can be uh, checked by the student, of 35.61%. We can also rewrite those cash flows to resemble a zero coupon kind of cash flow in which the there is no interim cash flow of 5,000, but this cash flow of 5,000 is postponed until the final year of the project by being reinvested at the IRR project rate at 35.61%, thereby giving us a final cash flow of 36,780.5. Now, it, I leave it to the student to determine that the IRR of the cash flow in column B is 35.61%, which is precisely the same as the cash flows shown in column A. From an IRR point of view, both sets of cash flows are the equivalent to each other. The only difference is that the interim cash flow of 5,000 has been extracted in the case of A and been placed in year two in B, reinvested at the IRR rate. Now, there leaves us the uh, task of looking at uh, the comparison of NPV and IRR methods. And one can see here with these simple examples of the uh, certain ambiguities that can arise. For example, uh, these, uh, if we had to choose between projects A and B, we can see that A has an IRR of 20%. But if the discount rate uh, appropriate to these projects was... 10%, then B would actually be favored over A because it has the higher NPV. In other words, we have ambiguity here. Here's another example where we have equivalent investment amount, but even there we have, we can demonstrate that there is the possibility of ambiguity uh, between, in terms of uh, outcomes. Project A has an NPV of 97, which is a little bit bigger than Project B. This is take using 9% as a discount rate, whereas the IRR of Project B is greater than Project A. Now, in, project, in investment appraisal, it's necessary for us to make um, allowances for or to take into account inflation and taxation when we adjust our cash flows. So it's important to be able to make the distinction between nominal and real cash flows. Here is a basic example which shows the relationship between cash flows discounted at 10% to give us a NPV of 7.6%. And these are nominal cash flows. If, however, we had as an assumption that we wanted to achieve a 10% real rate of return. And suppose inflation was 5%, then clearly we will not have generated the necessary returns uh, in, this, in these cash flows to have 
achieved a real return of 10%. I'll leave it to the student to work through the numbers here just to recreate the calculations and one can see that the net present value of these originally nominal cash flows um, if evaluated uh, based on a real return requirement of 10% will fall short and in fact the NPV is equal to minus 6.8%. Now, generally speaking, it is conceptually easier to use nominal cash flows when calculating project cash flows because the various groups of cash flows, revenues, costs, and so on, may grow at different inflation rates. And when this is the case, it is much easier for us to stick with the nominal expression of cash flows. Working in real terms is truly uh, somewhat uh, challenging from a conceptual point of view and working consistently is um, is quite difficult to achieve. Um, it remains here uh, the important uh, Fisher formula which is the formula for converting a nominal rate into a real rate and vice versa if we know the inflation rate that is operating on a set of cash flows. For example, uh, in the case that we have above, if we have an investment target of 10% real return and we need to overcome an inflation rate of 5%, then the Fisher formula will require us to multiply 1 plus the inflation rate plus times 1 plus the real rate uh, of return. And this will lead us to the nominal rate. In this case, 5% combined with 10% will produce a nominal rate of return of 15.5%. If we had applied this nominal rate to our nominal cash flows, which is the right thing to do conceptually, we can see that we have the same net present value in the cash flows, minus 6.8%, as we had when we converted our nominal cash flows to real cash flows and discounted at the real rate of 10%. In other words, nominal cash flows need to be discounted at a nominal discount rate and real cash flows need to be discounted at a real rate in order to preserve the proper uh, consistency in the discounting process. Finally, we leave the uh, discussion here with a numerical example which shows the impact of taxation on cash flows. Ta taxation, of course, is a cash outflow and therefore is relevant to our uh, determination of cash flows when discounting. And in fact, when taking into account and evaluating um, the savings that can be achieved um, by introducing uh, new or improved processes in our manufacturing, we need to take into account as well the tax on the savings because this becomes a relevant component in our calculations when we quantify savings. And this is a very basic numerical example which demonstrates how the tax implications of savings achieved on a process actually produce a negative net present value project, which means that the investment in the new process is not worthwhile because these savings are not great enough to overcome the required cost of capital and the taxes which are uh, going to be levied on our tax savings. Study these carefully and thank you.